Welcome back to the uh, next session. Uh, my name is Paul Kingsbury. I'm uh, in the Department of Geography at Simon Fraser University, and I want to thank Peter for inviting me to join in a, a good session. Thanks, Peter. Uh, the session's title is called The Event Horizon of Mega Events Beyond Once in a Lifetime. And we have uh, four speakers uh, for the session. Uh, the papers uh, can be about 20 minutes each, and that will give us about 45 minutes, uh, plenty of time for discussion, so it's a nice setup. Uh, let me introduce uh, the, the speakers and the paper titles. First, uh, we'll listen to Michael McKinney, uh, who's in drama at Queen Mary in London, and Michael's paper is called Mega Events and the Performance of Public Investment. Then we're delighted to welcome David Pinder, uh, in geography at Queen Mary also, and David's paper is Interrupting the Times and Spaces of the Olympic City. And then we have uh, Meg Holden uh, in Urban Studies and also uh, Geography at Simon Fraser University. And Meg's uh, paper is called The Politics and Values of Accelerated Urbanism in Post-Olympic Vancouver. And our final paper will be by Duncan Lowe, and Duncan is in communication at SFU, and Duncan's paper is entitled British Columbia's Olympic Decade, 2000 to 2010. So uh, let me welcome the first speaker, uh, Michael McKinney. Thanks. Um, I it should just say that it's sort of the genesis of this, this paper is that um, I got kind of interested in the fact that by the time the 2012 London Olympics rolled around, it was a very, very different economic climate in, in Britain than it had been in 2005 when the bid was, uh, was initially won. Um, and I'm kind of interested in, in sort of the politics of, of public spending around that. So um, as many of you will know, the 2012 Summer Olympics in London opened in spectacular fashion with an opening ceremony directed by film and theatre director Danny Boyle. The opening ceremony was lauded, in the UK at least, for its combination of inventive staging and clever mix of humour and high-mindedness. One short scene within the show attracted particular attention, and it's this part of the show that, um, that prompts some of the issues I want to explore, and however speculatively, here today. Um, it's the section that includes the tribute to Great Ormond Street Hospital and the National Health Service. This was part of a larger section of the ceremony that celebrated both the NHS and children's literature. And the use of Great Ormond Street, which is the country's oldest and most prominent children's hospital, provided a neat way to bridge the former with the latter. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that by necessity an opening ceremony has to juxtapose elements that sometimes have little to do with each other, but it kind of can't acknowledge that this is what's going on. Um, consequently, there's this veneer of, of, of ostensibly linear narration underpinned by a, a dramaturgy that can actually be quite experimental. So I want to play, to start off, um, a, a, a clip of the NHS scene. Um, which lasts approximately three minutes. And um, I'll try and audio describe, uh, however, I'm, I'm just also conscious that there is a commentary um, on the clip as well that's worth paying attention to. There's certainly many more than two voices. And now we move on to celebrate an institution which has, was founded the year of the last London Olympics in 1948. And we're going to see a very special example. Veuillez accueillir Mike Oldfield, accompagné du personnel du National Health Service et de nos invités d'honneur, des patients et le personnel du Great Ormond Street Hospital. Who thought tubular bells in the NHS? And the staff of the United Kingdom National Health Service. And our very special guest this evening, patients and staff of Great Ormond Street Hospital. Well, certainly, as I was saying, very special hospital looking after children. So all the staff are coming in with the beds, with children in the beds. And all the performers here, not uh, Michael no Bill. The base. <laughs> <laughs> all those on stage. Serious man. Here <laughs> looking after the children. Our regular members of the National Health staff. 
spelling out Gosh, Great Norman Street Hospital. Great Norman Street Hospital, Gosh. Mike Oldfield plays Tubular Bells, which is a huge hit for him. Children being tucked into bed by nurses. And everybody dances. Society can legitimately call itself civilized if a sick person is denied medical aid because of lack of means. As in Canada, the healthcare system is a national obsession in the UK um, and is a key preoccupation of governments of all political stripes. The NHS, as the commentator said, was founded in 1948 as one of the pillars of the welfare state established in Britain following the Second World War. The NHS scene within the London 2012 opening ceremonies, though, played out in relation to a very specific set of contemporary historical conditions. It was a spectacular tribute to social welfare at a time of economic austerity. Due to its heavy reliance on finance industries, the UK was hit especially hard by the 2008 credit crunch, which nearly ruined the country's banking system and required massive state intervention in order to prop up the country's key economic institutions. Um, then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, later said that um, the cash machines of Britain were hours away from running out of money. And he likely wasn't exaggerating. For a Labour government that had boasted that it had brought about an end to economic boom and bust, but which had also simultaneously promoted aggressive, aggressively promoted finance industries through deregulation and sympathetic changes to the tax system, the credit crunch brought about a sudden and messy end to this fantasy. It also plunged the economy into a deep recession. The 2010 national election produced a hung parliament and led to a coalition government comprised of the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. In its first budget, the new government took a sharp turn toward austerity. Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, introduced a budget that severely cut public spending and projected huge further cuts for more years to come. The effect of Osborne's austerity regime was to more or less halt the modest economic growth and push the British economy into another recession in 2011-12. Furthermore, huge parts of the public sector were subjected to wholesale restructuring, most notably the NHS, which was subjected to a vast array of market-oriented reforms, this was after the Tories as well had promised no more top-down reorganizations of the NHS when they came into office. That was one of the first things they set about doing. Seen in this context then, it's not surprising that the NHS segment of the opening ceremony stood out. In a time of imposed austerity and a health service facing a massive and unsettling reorganization, the NHS scene celebrated a key welfare state institution and public values that seemed at odds with the coalition government's economic policies. And I think the public investment in such services was reiterated soon after, during the Paralympic Games, when George Osborne was booed by the crowd while presenting medals. Um, his cuts to disability services ha had been especially unpopular, and the private contractor chosen to undertake the benefit assessments involved had also been awarded a huge security contract for the Olympics and screwed up both of them. 
Indeed, the construction of this NHS scene, I think, was very sophisticated in this regard, um, not to mention incredibly canny, to the point that it largely forestalled its ideological antagonists from expressing their disapproval publicly. And this is apart from one Tory MP, um, Aidan Byrne, who tweeted his derision, um, um, lefty multicultural crap. Um, they're all about Friday saying, what's next, a celebration of welfare? You know, well, in a sense, yes, that is, exactly what, that is exactly what was going on. Perversely, he was strangely correct. Um, he tweeted his derision, but, but, but was denounced even by, the, by, by the, uh, the prime minister from his own party as, as idiotic. I think the scene implicitly references the, uh, the fact that the NHS was established in the same year, 1948, that London last hosted the Summer Olympics. This was explicitly highlighted in both the BBC and the Eurosport television commentary, e even more so in the Eurosport commentary. Um, both mention Nye Bevan, the, 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 uh, the, health, uh, the Secretary of State for Health at the time of the creation of the NHS, um, saying, um, and the National Health Service is one of the great legacies, Nye Bevan in 18, 1948 said, to take pride in the fact that despite our financial and economic anxieties, we are still able to do the most civilized thing in the world but the welfare of the sick in front of every other consideration. Like 2012, 1948 was a time of economic austerity, the one that prompted the creation of new forms of social welfare rather than one that imposed austerity as a pretext for their weakening. The scene also diachronically posits a historical continuity between the NHS of 1948 and that of today by incorporating signs from both eras. The nurses and doctors are dressed in uniforms from the 1940s. But the NHS logo they come together to spell out is its current logo. It's that using down to the tight reproduction of the typeface through the, through the bodies. The presence of children, not only in this scene, but in the ones immediately preceding and following it, puts arguably the most romantic gloss possible on who the NHS exists to serve. This is not about drunks clogging up accident and emergency wards at the cost of the hard-working taxpayer. It's about the kids. And it also realizes, I think, the key aspiration of London's bid, legacy. What could be more noble than securing the future of our children's health, as the NHS does? The choreography of the scene also suggests a continuum between performative pleasure and social care. And I think you could probably continue on to find other things as well. The persuasiveness of this performance also depended on the extraordinary infrastructure that the Olympics themselves provided. As of March of this year, the Olympic Delivery Agency had spent approximately £6.9 billion on the Olympics, and the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games approximately another £2 billion, for a total of about £9 billion. This is more than twice the projected cost at the time London was awarded the Games in 2005. It's the rhetoric about on budget and on time is a, a lot, sounds a lot more plausible once you double the budget. <laughs> Notably, by the time the Olympics occurred, their value was increasingly articulated in Keynesian terms by media commentators and politicians as badly needed public investment during a time of recession. I think it's worth noting that, sort of as an aside here, the economic benefits of the games are thought by most economists to be negligible at best. They involve already anticipated spending, not new spending. Although the headline spending figure is large, it is spread over too long a period to have much effect on overall growth. And it arguably involves a less than ideal allocation of public resources. You wind up spending a lot of money on things you wouldn't otherwise while paying top price for them. The argument that Olympic Games leverage other benefits are complicated, therefore. Olympic Games may result in, in improvements to, say, transport systems, but this is usually bought at the expense of a number of very costly white elephants. Um, there were some uh, interesting pictures if you go on the Guardian website today. Um, somebody's done a photo series of, it just happens to be today, of, of um, the abandoned venues from Athens, nice, um, from the 96 Olympics in Athens, 2000 Olympics in Athens, pardon me. Um, a huge number of them have to be just been abandoned. Rhetorically, however, the spectacular tribute to the welfare state that the NHS scene entailed and that the Games as a whole reiterated appeared to be underpinned by exactly the type of state investment that the British government was attempting to disavow elsewhere. The appeal of the NHS scene, and arguably of the Games as a whole, was that they appeared doubly resistant, both as performance and as economics. 
This was performance and Keynesianism that worked. In a conversation with the Guardian newspaper, a, spokesman, a spokesperson for, the low, for LOCOG explained the difference between his organization and the Olympic Delivery Agency in theatrical terms. The ODA was responsible for coordinating and constructing the infrastructure, venues, transport, services, and so on, on which the games depended. LOCOG, in turn, coordinated the events themselves. The ODA, as the LOCOG rep COG representative put it, was responsible for building the theater. LOCOG, in turn, put on the show. Although LOCOG had the higher public profile, headed as it was by um, a former Olympic gold medalist and now conservative peer, Lord Sebastian Coe, it was the ODA that actually spent the lion's share of the Olympics budget. I'm interested here in this characterization of, uh, of the infrastructure as theater and the games themselves as the show. Not so much because the theatrical metaphor offers especially rich explanatory power, but because it simply draws the distinction between a performance and the infrastructure on which that performance depends. Um, as I said, the majority of the, of the money spent in the Olympics was by the ODA, not by LOCOG. It also arguably highlights the extent to which those of us, at least those of us who are theater and performance scholars, tend to focus more on the show than the theater that makes it possible although I think artists themselves are acutely aware <laughs> of, of, of these things. These are the institutions, built environments, forms of governance and capital that make the show possible, and which might be inscribed in its operations, though tracking this is, I think, a, a complex matter. I think following Shannon Jackson's lead, we might be better at thinking about performance itself as social infrastructure rather than the non-theatrical infrastructures of performance. The NHS scene in the opening ceremony arguably invites us to see the Olympic theatre, as operating according to the same logic as the performance given within it. But I don't think this is necessarily the case, and we might want to think more about this sort of constituent ten constitutive tension. I raise this, and in some ways this is, I'm doing this academic thing, that standard academic thing where you raise the question and then don't answer it, so forgive me. Um, I raise this because I think that London 2012 not only responded to austerity, it was caught up with the economic logic of austerity and, more intimately, with the logic of financialization that produced the austerity regime. One important example here, the Athletes' Village, which is now opening as East Village, a new neighborhood in Stratford, East London. East Village is the largest single legacy project of London 2012 and, after site preparation, is the largest single spending item in the Olympic budget greater than the venues or the improvements to transportation in East London, say. Economist Kostas Lepovitsis argues that financialization operates at the molecular level of accumulation, and the consequences of this are both historically distinctive and extraordinarily complex. One of the hallmarks of financialization is its diversion of capital investment away from the real economy into speculation on fictitious commodities, especially land and money. Thus, London has a massively inflated property market, as rentiers speculate on rapidly rising property values. And I don't think this should just be restricted to anxiety about um, you know, Russian foreign investors or Middle Eastern foreign investors, which is sort of the popular image. Um, it's very much uh, molecular, uh, or molecular, very much middle class homeowners who are, who are part of this. And this is independent of productive improvements to the city's stock of fixed assets. The East Village has been sold as a response to London's housing shock shortage, but it's a very particular type of response. This is housing built at state expense, the private investors initially imagined to underwrite it never materialized, that will be turned over to a Qatari investment fund at a massive write-down. The vast majority of the units will be private sector with fairly high calculations of what constitutes affordability. The East Village will create housing, to be fair, but it is much about the creation of a new private property market in East London as it is about providing housing. One does not need to create a market in order to do this, but that is impermissible at this particular historical moment. So and I'll just close with this. The question I think I'm ultimately left with, but I think can only begin to answer, and I, I look forward to, to, to coming back to it over the, over the next few days, is I suppose how we can under the, understand the relationship between the Olympic performance, which may be gloriously theatrical and politically progressive, as I think indeed this scene was, and the rather more ambivalent and complex infrastructures and economic logics that underpin them. Thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, our next presenter is uh, David Pinder, and David will present a paper entitled Interrupting the Times and Spaces of the Olympic City. Okay, um, so thanks very much for um, the invitation and it's been um, it's a real delight to be here and to be able to participate in these discussions. Um, as was mentioned, I'm um, a colleague of Michael's at Queen Mary but I'm in the Geography School and um, we're really looking forward to developing some of these conversations over time around these important issues. And my own work centres on urbanisation and urban cultures with a particular interest in urban art practice and spatial politics. And it's from that perspective and particularly from a position in East London that my comments derive, but I hope some of what I say um, may resonate with some wider discussions um, feeding through these few days. London 2013, Drifting Through the Ruins. This was the title of an exhibition at Hales Gallery in London in 2009 by the artist Laura Oldfield Ford. Drawings in bioacrylic and fluorescent pen showed brutalist concrete housing estates. High-rises with junk spilling out of graffiti garages, fly, flyovers and walkways in urban edge zones, an overturned car occupied squatted or abandoned buildings, rioters, defi defiant figures staring back, the artist herself depicted among them. London 2013, the year after that branded year when the party is left, when the shoots of legacy should be sprouting. However, against the slick images of a newborn Olympic park in East Village, injected with the generative properties of global capital, we have these images, many composed from wonders in the Lower, uh, lower Lee Valley that was erased to make way for the Olympic Games. Sites in the process of being evicted, demolished. Spaces in between, vague spaces that open to possibilities. Haunted spaces with traces of different modes of dwelling and occupation. Antagonistic spaces, contested spaces. At times, struggles erupt. At times, the ruins of pasts collide with the imagined ruins of the new world then just emerging. For example, the Westfield Shopping Mall, which was opened in 2008 and which provided the commodity-laden route to the Olympic Stadium for most of the visitors embarking at the, the Stratford uh, station, is here laid waste. Now, apocalyptic imagery has not been hard to find in depictions of the death and life of cities after the Olympics in London. In his recent book on the post-Olympics and East London, Phil Cohen starts with this image. And with an imagined account of hiring a gondola and approaching the London's Olympic Park uh, along the water after the city has been ravaged by the effects of another great world recession. He and his companions are, and I quote, overwhelmed by the awesome spectacle of the orbital tower, now leaning more crazily than ever Pisa's did, with noxious weeds from foreign parts clinging to its superstructure, creating a veritable hanging garden of, Lon of London Babylon. Disembarking, they find deserted walkways, mocking graffiti, live the nightmare, betray a generation. And even uh, the, the mascots of the Olympic Games, Wenlock and Mandeville, shown in the foreground here, they come across them now destitute and scavenging. Cohen notes the ease with which it's possible to conjure up this kind of apocalyptic imagery. And he presents it as something of a natural rejoinder to the kind of what he calls the facile optimism of Olympophiles who think that the Games can do no wrong. But as a cultural studies academic uh, and an ethnographer, he quickly steps back out of this apocalyptic imagery and argues for the need to move beyond entrenched positions for or against the Olympics themselves through a more grounded and dialectical approach, while still critical, that seeks to understand what's been happening in its aftermath. Yet in this presentation, I want to stay with the images produced by Oldfield Ford and some others like them for a different kind of provocation. This is one that's not simply directed 
at any determined yay says who still think that the Olympics can do no wrong, but rather at thinking about the temporal and spatial aspects of mega event urban development and so called regeneration, their event horizons, to use the title of this panel. What to make of their perspectives against the smooth images of redevelopment, against powerful notions of regeneration commonly in play? How might they interrupt, to use a term that I want to focus on, the times and spaces of the Olympic City? Shortly, I'm going to say a bit more about that and Oldfield Ford's work, but first to some initial remarks on urban development as it's self-interruptive. Mega-event and grand project urban developments are often constructed around claims of breaks, beginnings and fresh starts. A particularly vivid example that sought to capitalise on the potential offered by the Olympic Games was a promotional video by Newham Borough Council, which was the main host borough of, of the um, Olympics and Paralympic Games. For, this is a video for the 2010 Shanghai Expo. A regeneration supernova is currently exploding across Newham, London, it announces. This version is um, silent and with uh, Chinese subtitles. As the viewer plunges to earth to the centre of London and then uh, eastwards, supernova, a stellar explosion, a cosmic detonation, sending out huge shock waves. It's a strange metaphor to be using. What is left, the video suggests, is what they call an arc of opportunity for potential investors, where the scale of opportunity, as they put it, is 1,142 acres. This is placed as abstract space, what Newham's head of regeneration called a platform waiting for things to happen. In describing its early construction phase at the Olympic site itself, the London's Lib London Olympic Development Authority used less cosmically violent, but still a rather strange set of uh, words, demolish, dig, design. In so doing, it starkly contrasted the before, the blank, dark and decayed spaces with those to come, glossy CGI images, uh, depictions often from the air, but also where from the ground, typically of sun-dappled spaces with milling residents and visitors enjoying those kind of indistinct activities which are uh, often favoured on development billboards, somewhere between shopping, strolling, sipping cappuccinos, not working unless we're thinking of a kind of mobile phone-clad, indistinct, work-leisure kind of mode. Um, but certainly doing nothing to sully images of supposed harmony, convivial harmony. If, as a geographer Doreen Massey suggests, we might think of places as collections of stories so far, as weaving together of social relations and processes that span wider but intersect in particular ways to give places their distinct identities, uh, then those are thoroughly interrupted, and violently so, in this kind of spatial and temporal imaginary. They're demolished. No traces left in the new designs of those dent networks, for instance, of the low uh, Lee Valley. It's as cut as sharp as the famous blue fence, which we just um, saw a bit earlier with Neville's presentation. 18 kilometres long, three metres high, that encircled the Olympic Park uh, between 2007 and 2009, scything across fields, roads and footpaths to prevent intruders and prying eyes. A cut that covered spaces visually before they were raised in actuality as enacted by uh, an action by the artist uh, Gersha Verfel, who temporarily used sections of the fence as a gallery, posting up photographs of what was there and then painting over them, in this case uh, for the site of the uh, Olympic Stadium, eventually to leave a blank space. That action mimicked too that of a small army of ODA painters who endlessly circled this perimeter fence with cans of blue paint covering up any messages that might be on display other than those officially sanctioned of keep out or road closed or CGI depictions of the coming venues complete with sport corporate sponsor logos. For all that, the fence occasionally spoke with other voices. So ideas of tabula rasa, of scripting land as empty to facilitate its enclosure and occupation, of writing over, of course have a long history in colonialism and within capitalist urban development. Creative destruction, where the old is torn down to make way for the new, 
and particularly the more profitable, the cash rules everything around me in this image, is a hallmark of capitalist urbanisation, as is the uneven way it proceeds, disinvestment then paving a way when the chance for profitable reinvestment occurs for that reinvestment. Which is not to say that the character of the processes do not change over time. And Newham Council's promotional video, essentially an effort to lever in private finance to tackle the area's multiple dep deprivations, is testament to the road that's been travelled since the neoliberalisation of the 1970s. But it's in this context that I want to consider the interruptive potential of art practices and the roles played by the arts within oppositional cultures around the Olympics, which of course is something which has already been raised and something that will be discussed um, in, in many ways over the next few days. Um, and one volume in the British context which brings together some such oppositional practices, um, typically working outside of the official Olympiad, is this text from 2012. But also you might think of the theme issue edited by uh, Jen and Karen on contemporary theatre review, which offers other important perspectives, different perspectives. Key questions here include the political efficacy of practices, those around critical distance, working inside or outside, for example, and Karen's written very thoughtfully on some of those issues in that uh, special issue. What particularly interests me here, though, are some of the ways in which art practice might be said to interrupt perceptions and imaginations of development processes as spectacle. They're discourses of improvement and regeneration, their befores and their afters, their temporal and spatial logics built on claims of inevitability and necessity. And by interrupt here, I particularly have in mind the idea of arresting the flow by which things go on and opening up ways in which they might be thought about, perceived and imagined differently. And particularly significant here, I'm going to suggest is the interjection of a sense of space and time, not as abstract and linear, beholden to the demands of speculative investment, but multi-layered, folded and haunted. And a range of art practice might be discussed in relation to that. And, and um, Neville's work, which is going to talk more about tomorrow, raises important questions about some of these histories, for instance, that are being covered over. But here I want to return to the images with which I began. Alfred Ford's practice is varied, and beyond the drawings mentioned earlier, an important element has been a zine, Savage Messiah, produces a photocopied collage of drawings, photographs, and cut-out type texts, with obvious influences from punk and rave culture. There have been 13 issues since 2005, 10 of which were recently published in a, in a book by Verzo. Also significant are fly posters in public spaces, while underpinning all these elements are practices of wandering and drifting in the city. And anger pervades the work, directed particularly at forms of dispossession and displacement. This is posed particularly in class terms, where the deliberately anachronistic use of the term yuppie, which is very current in particularly 1980s London, is in abundance, and where we might think of certain humour alongside uh, the anger uh, in play. Violent simmers... Past upheavals and riots are often invoked in ways that seem particularly prescient in the light of then the riots that did explode on the streets of London in August 2011. The Olympics is a reference point early on for the redevelopments it's ushering in, in particular the enclosure and erasing of Lower Lee Valley. Death to the Gods of Mount Olympus announces the front, issue of issue, sorry, the front page of issue four from 2006. These are fly posters on the Olympics blue fence, posted by the collective of which he was part, We Are Bad. The wider commoditization and the closing down of public space are running concerns, at one point explicitly addressed in a quotation from Mike Davis, the urban critic. But there's also tenderness and beauty. The zines and drawings are diaristic, she writes. The city can be read as a palimpsest of layers of erasure and overwriting. The need to document the transient and ephemeral nature of the city is becoming increasingly urgent as the processes of enclosure and privatisation continue apace. With the drifting of daydreams, chance encounters, moments of epiphany, lives intertwining and parting, where London, and especially the liminal spaces of the Lower Lee Valley, its interstitial zones before the Olympics, is not simply a stage, but is the very fabric through which those activities take place. 
Ford at times connects the practice with psychogeography, a term that became increasingly current in the UK in the 1990s for practices concerned with exploring the interplay between places and behaviour, emotion and desire, and particularly with trying to uncover hidden histories of places, especially through free wandering and drifting. In the British context, it was particularly popularised by the writer Ian Sinclair in his extraordinary peripatetic accounts of East London. Um, and Sinclair was one of the most vocal critics of the Olympics, especially in this book from 2012, uh, Ghost Milk. But Sinclair soon distanced his work from that term, recognising it becoming a certain kind of brand. And Ford, in turn, worries about its, dissolution, its um, dilution, rather. Nevertheless, earlier versions of psychogeography associated with the Situationists and their predecessors in Paris in the 1950s remain important touchstones for her. And three particular connections um, are important I just want to highlight. The first is that for both the Situationists in the 50s and for her, the city is a key site of struggle. Both places, Paris then, but also London, contemporary London, are sites of large-scale urban transformation. The spectacle of urban development, to use the term of the situationist Guy Debord, might present the veneer of harmony and commonality, but masks underlying divisions and conflicts. The violence that Ford evokes in the zine, then, should be seen in a wider context of structural violence through which the urban spaces are being remade and through which certain groups are systematically marginalised and dispossessed. Second, there's a concern with experimenting with ways of using space and time in cities. The drifting, the refusal of time and space discipline based on the demands of work and organised leisure are essential to their mappings and depictions of urban spaces. And third, and this is the one I want to um, say a few remarks about in closing, there's a strong sense of loss. For old Paris, in the case of the Situationists writing in the 50s, of East London in the case of Ford. In the case of the Situationists, is centred around sites of the city that were destroyed to make way for the new. For example, the old uh, marketplaces in the centre of Paris, of Les Halles, uh, which are shown here in an early film by de Boer, and later destroyed at the end of the 1960s. For a time, they favoured such sites for what they saw as their distance, or at least their shadowy relationship with urban spectacle. Documenting the destruction of another street in 1954, the Rue Sauvage, they celebrated it as more alive than the Champs-Élysées with all its lights. And it wasn't the charm of ruins that drew them, they insisted, but the sense of... Um, uh, sorry. Um, not the charm of, of ruins, but the sense that... Um, of the kind of a sense of aliveness that they felt was uh, in this place that was... Uh, disappearing. There's um, certain kinds of risks, undoubtedly, in um, in uh, in some of this evocation of a sense of loss, a particular sense of nostalgia for the old and a sense of, sort of harking back, a sense which there may be a certain kind of aestheticization of dilapidation and decay, um, but also a sense in which um, it may contribute to a certain kind of um, chic of places. Um, and one, at one point, Ford uh, notes how graffiti in a particular zone of the city might, uh, might sort of conjure up a sense of a, a kind of radical chic, which might contribute to its gentrification. Um, but with the Situationists and with Ford, I think, there's a clear sense it's not modernisation or development per se that's being resisted, but rather the partial interests that uh, are embodied within it and the partial interests which are being obscured by the language of modernisation. In a similar way, Ford's drawings and practices speak not of refusal, then, of development as such, but the forms they're currently taking under conditions of neoliberal capitalism. But important to the critical perspectives that she brings uh, is this interruption of a linear temporal logics of progress, and in part, that comes to the collage form of the zines themselves. As Mark Fisher writes, she deploys collage in a similar way to William Burroughs', William Burroughs did, as a weapon in time war. 
The cut-up can dislocate established narratives, break habits, allow new associations to occur, he writes. There's also, interestingly, the material form of the zine itself, which is, um, in its roughness, in its kind of deliberate repudiation of the smooth values of digital production, is deliberately out of time and resistant and evoking other paths. But further, there's the way in which the times and spaces in the work are multi-layered, threatening to burst into their present. In relation to one drift, she writes, in the fabric of the architecture, I uncover traces and palimpsests, the polytemporality of the city. As I lay my palm flat against the wall, I buffer multiple traces of past workings and reworkings, the polychromatic riot of London's histories in shimmering and tangled lines. And other points, a variety of dates are encanted in the images. There's a sense of time being folded into the present, of dates 1973, 74, 80, 81. Times where perhaps there's particular intense turning point senses a possibility, which again might suddenly burst into the present or inform the present. Spaces for her in this way are haunted by what happened there, but also, crucially, by what might uh, return. What are the ghosts um, of places that she's asking? One of her preoccupations in particular is with the modernist housing states, the post-war welfare state, which emerged out of the ruins of the uh, Second World War. What are the ghosts of those estates as they fall into ruins, she asks? What dreams might they harbour? And what futures might they still point to? And hence, what, what ghosts might the structures of the Olympic sites contain? What possibilities could be forged from those ruins in the future? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. And our next speaker is uh, Meg Holden. Meg's paper is entitled The Politics and Values of Accelerated Urbanism in Post-Olympic Vancouver. We're just trying to get the PowerPoint to come up. Just, Sorry about this. Okay. Right, sometimes maybe I'll just start. Okay, hi everybody, sorry for that. Um, so my name's Meg Holden and I'm typically an, an urban sustainability researcher. And so I want, what I wanted to offer you today is some thoughts that, uh, from, and perspectives that I got from the city of Vancouver, which for, for 
those foreigners among you, are, is, a, is a, the small central city part of the larger region. Um, but the one that, that really has benefited um, in terms of branding and in terms of development activity from the, the, uh, the fact of hosting the 2010 Olympic Games. And um, why is this relevant to your um, interest here? It is that when I went to the City of Vancouver staff and council um, and, uh, and, and citizen participants who have been engaged in sustainability planning and, uh, and, and climate change planning and policy in the city over the past um, five or more years, and I asked them, um, you know, what have been some of the key drivers of sustainability work and climate change work in the city of Vancouver, which does have a, quite a long history of being engaged in that kind of work. The answer surprised, surprised me um, in that coming from many different uh, sectors, it was, well, the Olympics. The Olympics was a real driver for a lot of, of our work. And so I want to I wanna offer some perspectives um, about how the, the ho hosting event and the hosting status around the, the 2010 Winter Olympics is considered by the city and by citizen participants um, to have affected urban development trends, but more the, the politics um, of urban development in the city of Vancouver too. And then I'll leave it to, to, to people like Duncan and, and others to um, help us interpret uh, how that affects the arts specifically as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, this notion of accelerating urbanism, which I think would be the sort of the summary statement for how I see um, the Olympics to have affected the city of Vancouver particularly. Um, uh, and I'm going to tie that to uh, Anders Bloch's notion of green cosmopolitanism um, within the sort of the, the umbrella um, logic of ec ecological modernization. Um, and there are three, three, three ways that I'm going to um, talk about this effect of accelerating urbanism in, in terms of politics and the culture of urban development in Vancouver. One is changes in this notion of governance capacity um, and the, the mobilizing power of cities. Um, two is, and that's the, the mobilizing capital as well as mobilizing um, uh, ideas about uh, what about society and what life is for. Um, secondly, changing the need and the role of publics when we talk about public participation and and this is a, a place where I think the role of the arts does does change considerably as well. Um, and then thirdly, change in the structure of city government and the way that city government uh, conceives its own work um, in the practice of city building. And I'm going, to, I'm going to draw some conclusions within those three themes, and I'm going to talk about some risks that, that I've seen and that others have noted to me as well. Okay, so when I talk about accelerating urbanism, um, I'm talking about this big global um, shift to, of, of people towards cities. Um, this, this graph, I'm, or variations of it, I'm sure will be no surprise um, to you guys in this room. Um, and so it's a, it's a clear demographic shift. Uh, however, the point that, that a growing, growing ranks of social theorists, sociologists, geographers, um, political scientists, and others have, have, have started to remake, it's not a brand new argument, of course, um, is that this is actually not just changing the lives for city dwellers, it's actually changing our, um, the global cultural scene as well as, um, as cities become the norm and urban, urbanism becomes a way of life uh, to which um, few people do not aspire if, they're not, um, already, uh, cons if they don't already consider themselves to live it. Um, so, uh, in the words of the Canadian political scientist Warren Magnuson, he, he urges us to see like a city, as uh, James C. Scott um, uh, once advised us to, to think, to see like a state, if we were going to understand the effects of, of politics in place on our behaviors and actions. So it's become a, a popular refrain. Here are some examples. Um, the, the Copenhagen, at the, the Copenhagen Climate Summit, there was, a, in 2009, there was a, a gathering of mayors who, 
who called upon uh, the need for international global dialogues, but not of nation states, as we have done since the end of the Second World War, but global meetings of mayors, particularly because drawing a clear distinction between nation, national leaders who get together and just uh, politic and, um, and drag their feet, and, and, uh, and, and mayors which... Um, behave on behalf of cities and, and cities that act, right? Um, similarly, in the context of the revisions and the, um, the, the um, a next phase for the Millennium Development Goals, which um, are wrapping up in 2015, the next phase will be called the Sustainable Development Goals, and there has been a growing concerted call for these new goals to focus specifically on cities as key to development worldwide. Um, and then the, the political scientist Benjamin Barber, um, in his recent book, If Mayors Ruled the World, calling for uh, the creation of a global parliament of mayors, um, and actually taking some steps, um, I understand, mostly with mayors in the Netherlands to, to try and bring such a, a global parliament together. Um, and here's a... Uh, an opinion piece from Richard Florida, returning home from the, this spring's World Urban Forum in Medellin, Colombia, um, uh, making a case for why urban, urbanization and urban development is the key challenge facing um, the United Nations in terms of trying to guide global development towards uh, a, a better path for, for, for more people. So this has uh, key implications for um, my field of study for sustainable development and climate, or it's at least argued to. Um, whereas uh, in, the, in the 1990s and, and earlier, cities were seen to be the, the root of all evil where it came to environmental concerns, sustainability concerns, because cities were ugly, they, they were dirty, they were where industrial pollution happened. Um, and then the hinterland, the rural places were where you know, sustainable lives could be uh, led because they were uh, in keeping with natural rhythms, they were in harmony with natural processes, they um, engaged uh, more directly and on an everyday basis with the natural world. Um, this whole logic has really turned on its head. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but I, but I, and I, and and you can certainly see this, uh, if nowhere else in the world, certainly in British Columbia, where I can recall in in 1992 we had a, a summer of of protests in in a, a piece of the mid coast of British Columbia called Clackwit Sound. Um, which really resulted, it was a large-scale civic protest um, in a very remote uh, ancient forested part of the province, which really had wide-ranging impacts, long-term impacts on the way that forestry is practiced in this province, um, and sort of was seen to be a success for the environmental movement in terms of protecting this pristine wilderness from the likes of you know, urban capitalists who um, were going to try and pave over wilderness. Well, here, so, so, so the logic was, um, you know, cities being the, the root of power, corrupting pristine nature. Nowadays, the, this is um, our, our premier on the, the left um, in northern British Columbia, um, uh, advocating the expansion of um, in more industrial activities. Um, we have now almost completely flipped that logic on the head where outside of cities in, in rural British Columbia is the, um, the landscape of, uh, of industrial development, of economic growth driven by resource extraction. We have, uh, we've recently had a, a, a major uh, breach of, um, of, of, uh, of a mining um, Tailings Pond uh, Dam, which the 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 provincial cabinet has far from naughty, far from um, reprimanding the the mining company, is actually just trying to downplay the extent of the environmental damage. And then compare that with the image on the the right, which is taken from the city of Vancouver's Greenest City Action Plan, um, where the city of Vancouver is aiming to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. And it's a very different. Um, kind of attitude that city that the city of Vancouver and I think a lot of um, sort of global 
uh, global cities uh, are trying to are trying to to capture this kind of an image. Um, so that's the, that's so it's an acceleration pattern of urbanization, and it's an ecological modernization pattern of urbanization as well. Um, what I wanted to show uh, with regard to this graph is how this is affecting the city of Vancouver disproportionately. So what this graph shows um, is the housing growth in uh, the different municipalities um, in the Metro Vancouver region, so that's along the x-axis. Um, the bars represent 2011, 2012, and 2013. So you can see where home building is occurring. Um, post-2010 Olympics. And then the, the line above it is the, the municipal target for housing growth. And so these were established within the regional planning fr framework. Um, we had a, a new regional growth strategy in 2011. Um, and you can see that uh, what the regional plan has really called for and, and expected to happen was the sort of the, the, the maxing out of the appeal of dense urban living in the city of Vancouver proper and the spreading of uh, development activity out to primarily Surrey, which is the highest point um, in the line graph right beside Vancouver there, um, and then all, secondarily Burnaby, which is that other peak in the line, um, the two sort of second cities, the second and third city of the region. But when you look at the bars, you see that exactly the opposite is happening, right? So those two um, cities, which we would expect if, if um, people were actually getting tired of density and of the kind of prospect for urban living that the city of Vancouver proper offers, um, that they would be moving out to Burnaby and Surrey more, they're not doing that. And in fact, Vancouver is you know, surpassing what um, they expected to be doing in terms of development and housing and, and, and um, making space in the sky, mostly, uh, for more and more people. So definitely a pattern of accelerating urbanism and an ecologically modernizing pattern, too. And so by ecological modernization, um, what I mean is a sort of a greening of the capitalist uh, development pattern so that the city is uh, pursuing a green agenda. Um, and in the context of, of Olympic studies, we're often interested in, in comparing, say, London and Vancouver's approach to that kind of a, a, a greening development trend. Um, the, the, what we can see in a graph like this is how um, Vancouver is attempting to uh, brand itself as an ecologically modern city um, by setting ambitious targets. Uh, here you, the target is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 33%. Um, and making you know, pretty moderate progress, really, towards achieving those targets um, through activities uh, such as putting caps on landfills, um, shifting city fleet vehicles over to electric vehicles, and pursuing different kinds of, um, of, uh, of electric um, vehicle policies um, and, uh, and tra transportation demand management. Um, now, the city recognizes that um, any work that they do is going to be trumped by, say, resource exploitation and mining and, and natural gas development um, outside of the city when it comes to meeting their own um, targets. But the interesting shifts in, shift in terms of the leadership role that the city is willing to take um, in, promoting, uh, in promoting an agenda of decreasing emissions um, in spite of that and in spite of its small scale um, I think is indicative of the, the, its leadership experience and the, the confidence that that built for the city in hosting the Olympic Games. Um, the other point I wanted to make just briefly about green cosmopolitanism is that this is seen to be a fairly um, universal pattern, right? There's uh, the... The C40 cities, for example, um, hosted by former Mayor Bloomberg of New York, uh, is a group of cities that have all embraced a similar ecological modernization goal. Um, however, I think that when we look specifically at uh, the particular cities that are making these aspirations, we can see different kinds of politics 
playing out um, in these aspirations and in, in how, they, how they articulate them and how they're able to make progress towards them. Uh, here's another example from the Greenest City Action Plan, which just sort of uh, drives home the, the unproblematic relationship that the city of Vancouver advances between um, economic development, uh, promotion of, uh, of a, a steady stream of large-scale events. This is referring to Vancouver's recent coup in hosting the TED conference. Um, and, also, and, and how Vancouver is boasting of the particular value that, the, um, that TED curator Chris Anderson saw in Vancouver as being something different uh, and yet something that, was, uh, that had everything that they were looking for. So here's just uh, the, the point that I was trying to make about the, the global and localization um, effects of green cosmopolitanization from the Danish social theorist Anders Bloch. That we need to, that, that by looking at the socially situated nature of urban politics, uh, we are able to see um, differences in a green cosmopolitan agenda because the, the agenda gets fixed locally and then re-globalized again and again, particularly as we think about um, how the city um, hosts global events uh, like the Olympic Games and then broadcasts those events and, and its experience and its uh, expertise uh, back out again to the, the global elite community. Okay, so the first way in which I think uh, the city has told me and the city ex understands its, the, the effects of hosting the Olympics on its own activities is, uh, is a sort of in, in emboldening the city government that um, they, do, they are not um, limited to their own jurisdictional role as uh, being creatures of the province in the Canadian constitution, that cities uh, can overreach their jurisdictional limits. Uh, they don't have to be uh, satisfied with being the, the, the lowest uh, order of government in the hierarchy. In fact, they can think of their governance capacity, um, which is Patsy Healy's term, in terms of their ability uh, to mobilize power because so many people are willing to mobilize themselves uh, for their city. Um, it means that it's a, a different kind of understanding of urban power compared to um, the sort of the traditional enacting of government. It's the sort of shift to um, governance that can only be achieved in power and in, in partnership and with the mobilization of power uh, amongst a broad group of people. Um, an interesting, th the second thing is, is with regard to how the city is dealing with publics. Now, the, the city of Vancouver, as an as a urban planner, as an urban planning agency, see, has, has for a long time seen itself as a participatory um, agency, as, as having an interest and an expertise in public participation. Um, However, there has been, I think, an emerging dynamic of dread with regard to public participation in which um, city staff, they go out to do public participation exercises expecting to get battered and beat up. Citizens go in expecting a, a combative kind of atmosphere. Um, neither party expects um, the other to take their, their voice seriously. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a dreaded experience for, for most who are involved. And I think that with the Olympics um, and the sort of the, the success that was perceived um, within the city government around uh, being able to come to some key compromises, um, that uh, dynamic of dread has been to a certain extent overcome um, so that we're seeing new kinds of citizen participation exercises that are engaging over a much longer period of time, engaging with a much larger uh, group of people. The, the Greenest City Action Plan that I recently, re that I referred to a few minutes ago um, is 
claims to have engaged 20,000 uh, residents in the, in the crafting of, of the plan, engaged new partners in the form of um, the, the major philanthropic organization in town, the, the Vancouver Foundation, to um, fund a series of citizen uh, and small organizational grants in order to help with the implementation of the Greenest City Plan. Uh, and they've been experimenting with a, a range of new kinds of uh, citizen engagement and participatory and partnership initiatives. And this experience has really uh, caught the attention and the, the imagination of citizen sta of city staff uh, who are tasked with designing these processes. And one of the, the implications for the arts is that arts-enriched public participation events, um, pachakacha events, and um, the use of public art as a way to engage people in helping to enliven city spaces, um, pop-up parks and different kinds of installations are seen as being really key to the formal work of governance and the formal work of engaging people authentically as well. And then the, the, final, the final effect that I see um, the hosting the Olympics as having on the city government um, <clears throat> in Vancouver and urban development processes is on the organizational structure of the city itself. So here's Councillor Andrea Reimer, uh, one of the sort of activist councillors, um, who's saying that, you know, we really learned how to partner um, by working through the Olympic Games. Um, uh, because we had to, because it was a deadline, because it was a, an obligation. We didn't want to be um, publicly embarrassed, uh, and the stakes were high enough that we had to overcome our anxieties and our sort of bureaucratic habits. So here, continuing on, I'll give you a moment to read this quote, and I'll ask my daughters to pipe down. So, um, so th they point to impacts uh, in terms of the Greenest City Plan, which did, uh, which was not owned by a particular department in the in the city government. They point to efforts in Open Streets, which is an initiative in um, in sort of hand resting authority for uh, how streets are managed and what gets to happen in streets from the engineering department to engaging social planners, engaging uh, parks planners and other kinds of um, people and other kinds of expertise in, in decisions about streets, uh, for example, as ways in which this horizontal um, organizational shift is happening. Um, I mean, it's still a top-down organization, and, uh, and I don't think anybody's arguing that this shift has been fundamental or complete, but it's, it has been notable to the people who work within the, the city structure of about 10,000 people. Um, so the, the, the most hopeful um, conclusions that I would draw from these, these three trends would be that uh, the experience of hosting what are considered locally um, by, by many to have been a, a fairly successful um, Olympics um, has been the uh, investing the city with some amount of confidence to lead um, not to wait for provincial approval in particular with regard to their, their sort of their role in the governance hierarchy this track record of success in, in, uh, in accomplishing a common goal through teamwork um, and then this idea that through success uh, in ecologically modernizing the city, they are able to drive more interest in, uh, in engagement and in partnership. So it is, it is, this is, you know, this is sort of a, a virtuous green circle kind of story. Um, however, of course, it has some, some big caveats. Um, the, the, the point that I'd like to emphasize the critique that I'd like to emphasize with regard to the, the first thing about the, the, the partnership aspect and the, the confidence to lead and seize power 
um, is that there are, as the city learns to work with different groups, there are certainly comfort, different levels of comfort working with different groups. Um, the city is quite comfortable, um, more comfortable working with developers, for example, than it is working with citizen groups um, or neighborhood-based groups. Uh, and there's a different tone to, those kinds, to the kinds of partnerships that the city is willing to strike with those different groups. Um, second, with regard to the public participation, I, I think that one of the key uh, risks within this trend is a sort of overreaching of ex the acceleration. So this is another um, result uh, of, from, the, uh, from the implementation plan of the Greenest City Action Plan. And this is showing um, the city's, uh, the city's um, crazy results uh, with regard to public participation, um, but the goal here is, uh, is reducing ecological footprint. So there's an assumption here that just by engaging people that you will be able to somehow lead to people taking action to reduce their ecological footprint. Um, and then this, this final quote is just to call attention to the fact that even those within who are advisors to the city recognize that this, um, this trend is still a trend towards uh, increasing financialization or uh, economic dominance of the land and the space. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Our uh, final paper is by uh, Duncan Lowe, and Duncan is uh, with Department of Communication at SFU, and his paper is entitled British Columbia's Olympic Decade Organised. Um, I would have just started this morning by putting that slide and then just jumping in, but listening to the artists talk this morning and sort of putting the, their positions, I thought I need to sort of just say where this journey started for me. And in 2001, I was the director of the Vancouver East Cultural Centre, um, and I was seconded from the Vancouver East Cultural Centre to work out of the Olympic office for eight months, seven or eight months, to produce something called Celebration 2010 which was a province-wide festival, to coincide with the IOC's last visit going through town before making their final decision. Um, and working out of the Olympic office, um, you heard a, a constant about the legacy, the wonder, the joy. It was going to be special. And then it also became apparent that because the time factor was so um, up, up, challenging, were we, were we um, creating an artistic event? Or were we moving $900,000 quickly out into the province and making sure that various cities and their places? Oh, various uh, places, sorry. Various places were, 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 were covered. So that was the first part I wanted to put. Um, and then watching the um, Jenny's uh, and Alex's um, Paralympic video this morning, I, I saw a performer who floated above the, the stadium in the, in the Paralympic opening ceremony um, that I presented um, as part of Can Do Co on the Vancouver East Cultural Centre stage. Um, and this was after we'd secured the Games. And it was interesting because, as many of you know, the Vancouver East Cultural Centre uh, didn't really have great facilities at that time. Like, for example, the dressing rooms were in the basement 
and if you're in a wheelchair, um, you couldn't get there. So we didn't have the facilities. We put some performers in kitchens and etc. And at the same time as we were trying to run a capital campaign to improve the facilities, which has now happened, the NPA, I'm going to say the NPA because you can always talk about past political masters, um, were, were passing decisions in council about how they were going to put 20 million into an endowment fund for this and this. And you thought, why can't we have disabled art, etc.? Um, but we can do some things but not others. And it's that that made you think, well, I wonder how this journey will end. Um, and that's when I hooked up with Urban Studies in 2006 to look at the Olympics. So with that said, I will look at the decade. Um, Gordon Campbell was elected, sorry, I'm going to, Gordon Campbell, oh, sorry. Um, Gordon Campbell was elected in May 2001. The BC Liberals won the election campaign on a document that promised many things, including to ensure that music and arts curriculums would be fully funded in BC's public schools. Um, to support BC's bid to host the Vancouver Olympics, to increase funding for the BC... Um, I didn't... Oh, I've moved on one, sorry. Um, um, to increase funding for BC's Arts Council to promote and support BC artists, music and culture, and to stimulate tourism. <clears throat> Two cultural themes ran through this Olympic decade, influencing many of the government's decisions. The new or creative economy and Richard Florida's creative class and the creative class theory. And as um, when I was interviewing Don Shumka, who was the chair of the BC Arts Council for much of this decade, he made the point that, that Premier Campbell was a big believer in the creative class and in the new economy. Um, much has been written on the cultural versus creative industry debate and the exact role of the not-for-profit performing and visual arts in that debate. For the purpose of this presentation, um, it is necessary to not only recognize this ongoing debate, but also to clearly state that from a performing, visual, and media arts perspective, the current lack of definitional clarity surrounding the creative cultural terminology make blanket comparisons challenging, if not meaningless. This example illustrates the impacts of this definitional confusion. In the BC, 2000, BC Films 2000-2001 final report coincided with the election of the BC Liberals. And due to changes of the government, the authors of the report edited the document replacing the word culture with creativity, which they felt was more in tune with the creative class and the new economy of the forthcoming Liberal We can see evidence of Richard Florida's creative class theory becoming increasingly visible in BC. Here are just two examples of how the creative speak um, was being incorporated into municipal cultural policy. Here we have a small town, 13,000, the creative economy, Richard Florida, um, also Campbell River. Um, Nanaimo, in their um, cultural plan, talked about investing in arts and culture will strengthen our economic base. So we're starting to see this, this debate about, are we talking about art or are we talking about economics? Uh, it's an interesting one that goes through the decade. From the moment BC secured the games, Gordon Campbell continuously prompt and primed the creative sector in readiness. When the world arrives here in 2010, we want visitors to discover that a world of arts and culture is already here. The Olympic decade bore characteristics of the market-driven, the neoliberal, tax breaks, one-off cash injections, declining levels of public subsidy. One example was the Arts Now program, um, which came into being after we'd secured the bid um, and was run through th uh, programs, the catalyst programs, the exploration programs, the innovation programs. And these were all project-based, not operational funding. You, as an artist or a company, you applied for project support. And it came in in 2004, and the program had completely wound down by the end of 2010. 
an example of that, that short-termism. Um, in 1982, we were talking about this, Michael, um, an internal Canadian government review, the first since the Massey report, argued not to confuse cultural policy with infrastructure policy. Quote, the bricks and mortar are necessary, but they are not the end product, the purpose of it all. And cultural policy must place a new emphasis on encouraging the best use of our concert halls, theatres, cinemas and galleries for the presentation to Canadians of the finest works of Canada's own creative artists. So it, it, it's interesting that as we move through the decade, we we see, uh, we'll come to the Playhouse Theatre Company later, but we see large amounts of investment into buildings and concrete and carpets and curtains, but at times the actual production of the art doesn't quite match it on that front. So, and, and as you can see here, one-offs, one-off investment funds through the decade. I must get a drink of water. Sorry about that. So, yes, so um, now we're going to look at what happened on the ground. Any successful Olympic bid must include plans for a cultural Olympiad. Vancouver's bid included a proposed three year cultural Olympiad 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, as with any bid, um, it changes. Once you secure it, things change. We bid for a security budget of $127 million. It actually came in at $1.2 billion. We bid we were going to build a conference centre at $300 million, and I think that was $900 million. But the point being that as some costs go up, others go down. And historically, in the Olympics, the arts and cultural component is, is often one of the first to get cut or, or messed around with, as they say. So... Can you see? Yes. So what happened is as we went from the three-year proposal to a three-week in 08, three-week in 09, seven-week in 010, what happened was some arts organisations got excluded from that cultural Olympiad opportunity window. And we see it here. Um, if your festival coincided just before the Olympic period, push, January, if it coincided just afterwards, um, dance, uh, dance, festival, um, then, then you were in, included in the Olympic cash supply. If your festival took place in May, you didn't um, get that, that, that bump. And, and I just used these as three examples. There are actually 26 festivals, 28 festivals. So it's just the way things happen, but this comes with it, as it were. Um, if we look at the Lower Mainland, um, case study comparisons. I looked at a number of case study organizations in the Lower Mainland. And the key pattern that emerges from these case studies is that in 2009-2010 saw a funding high with across-the-board declines the year after the, the Olympics had left town. Um, in some cases, the interesting ones are a couple of really interesting ones here. The Playhouse Theatre, the green one, their 2011 figure was actually lower than where they were in 2003 when the bid was successful. Um, there are other ones. The other one I wanted to point out was the Scotiabank Dance Centre, which is somewhere down here. Um, Canada's only purpose-built centre for dance actually didn't present any dance, Canadian or otherwise, during the 2010 Cultural Olympiad. And the reason for that was that they were called the Scotiabank Dance Centre and the official sponsors of the Olympics was called the RBC Bank. So you can see there you go, hmm, are, are we art? Is this doing the art scene a great service? Um, so that is the um, case study comparisons. If we move on to... My partner said to me this morning, she said, now, remember to speak slowly. <laughs> if we move into um, other areas of the province, um, and this is looking at the funding records of the BC Arts Council through this decade, um, I don't need to go into every 
you get the picture. Um, 2010, we see a funding and then a, a decline. As, as costs go up, they have to give somewhere. And we saw this across the province. If we then look at the other stream of funding, community gaming and bingo, what we see here um, is that in 2009, the government took the decision to cut direct access gaming funding by $20 million. As a result of these influences, there were riots, artists' riots in Victoria and Vancouver. And to coincide with this slide and the slide before, I should add that in 2012, Finance Minister Kevin Falcon said, arts and cultural groups got the short end of the stick when the government tried to exert fiscal discipline in 0809. Quote, in retrospect, it was a mistake at how aggressively we did that. So the overall funding trend, the important thing to note is that the blue line represents the overall BC government arts funding from the bid, before the bid, successful of the bid, the games and after. And as you can see, from we, we got the bid, funding's on the increase. It's going well. We get up to about 2008, 2009, maybe the conference centre's coming in at 900 million then, not two. I'm being flippant, but I shouldn't be. And then it goes down. The other thing is when you look at the, the red line, which is BC Arts Council funding to institutions outside of the Lower Mainland that was included, and the green line, you see a counterbalance between as BC Arts Council funding was cut back, 08, 09, um, there was some counterbalancing between gaming funds um, and BC Arts Council funds. I have heard a story, but it is unverified, I have to say, that some, uh, a couple of people received a BC Arts Council grant on a gaming check. So there was obviously something going on here at that time. But the key one is the blue, because that gives us the overall funding trend. Um, moving on to community and cultural tourism, which was another central component. Tourism, arts culture is a central component of the, of the system. At the 2004 UBCM Municipality Conference, the Premier, using the Olympics as a motivator, launched the Community Tourism Programme. Part of the aim was to double BC's tourism by 2015. Um, this, was, again, was a one-off payment where um, cities, municipalities across the province could apply to the $25 million fund to say, we've got an idea for an arts event or an arts festival or not this and they could give them money um, and that would bring tourists using the the link between cultural tourism and the arts um, robert van weisberg ubc who headed the final olympic impact report released last october um, was quoted as saying the increase in tourism just never happened and as you can see, the BC Statistics Report of 2011 said that over the decade, from 2001 to 2011, the volume of travellers to the province has shrunk roughly by a third. These are quite, quite interesting figures. If we stick with um, community and cultural tourism, um, Hughes, in his article, Tourism and the Arts, said that tourism may have an undesirable long-term effect on the arts. And, quote, tourism may now be an unwitting collaborator in the suffocation of the arts. We can see here that Campbell River, a, a, a city in the province, 2007, tourism, cultural activity. 2011, the cruise ship terminal didn't fail because they, they built a terminal, um, but no one really thought, well, hold on, if we want people to get off the boat, what are they going to do when they're off there? As a result, the boats just carry on now to Alaska. They don't stop there. And then when you look at the Stats Canada of the number of people who are employed as a result of artistic activity, they're pretty much the same. That, that there isn't that, 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 that big boost that, that tourism, we, the arranged marriage between tour, that the government want to arrange that marriage between primarily the for-profit tourism sector 
and the not-for-profit arts sector. If we're going to go into this relationship, we've got to be very clear about how it's going to work so that all parties benefit in a sustainable manner. Um, the Canadian, and I, and I, and as part of that sort of warning, the Canadian Tourism Research Institute in 2012 recently stated that the tourism industry, in order to solve its looming labour shortage, can do one of two things. Either pay more, God, thought, <laughs> or improve their labour supply by identifying underutilised labour pools, such as mature workers, persons with disabilities, and new immigrants, and implement policies to attract these potential employees. So if the professional arts and cultural sector is going to go down this cultural tourism journey, we've got to be absolutely clear of where we're coming from because as we go back to what we were talking about yesterday, in the Applebaum report written 30 years ago, he was saying that the people who subsidize arts in this country are primarily artists. And if we're going to get into these kind of discussions, um, we need to take care. A um, couple of final thoughts. Um, in my interview with Don Shumka, um, who, as I say, was, was the chair of the BC Arts Council for much of this decade, he came to the conclusion that um, he didn't think there was a lasting benefit to the arts as a result of the Olympic experience. Jane Danzo, um, the devastator, she is quoted in her resignation speech. Uh, she was in the position for a year and then resigned, saying, the devastating impact of that decision, cutting arts funding, is being felt by artists and arts organizations throughout the province. There were successes. The tax credits for film and TV, um, we can see that they went up through this Olympic decade. Um, in an interview with the book publishing, they said that they weren't really touched by the Olympics, but the 2006 tax credit has done them a power of good. The, 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 the difficulty is here, and this is what we're seeing now with the creative industry, with Microsoft, um, the, the um, it'll come to me, um, the gaming industry, is that as we raise our tax breaks, then Montreal will match the tax break and Toronto will match the tax break. So we, so an, a large company, I think it was Microsoft, recently announced that they're moving a number of workers to the cultural and creative industries in Vancouver, but 65% of the salaries are paid by tax breaks. Um, and when asked, will they commit to a long term, well, we'll see what the other tax breaks do. And this is happening in book publishing and in uh, um, film as well. Um, there was also um, the Renaissance Fund, the 150 Fund. Um, in terms of infrastructure support, the Vancouver Art Gallery, started by Campbell's one-off 50 million, is just leaving the starting gate. It's too early to tell. Will it be the new Guggenheim from Bilbao, or will it be the Niemeyer in Alvarez? It, 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 we're, just, we're just on the way out there, so we don't know that yet. Um, I picked a couple of statements sort of to sum up the Olympic decade. And I thought this one stuck really in my head because five months after the Olympics wrapped up and moved on, there was a, there was a headline in the Vancouver Sun which says, arts festivals cut off from gambling funds, social development minister defends decision to end funding for music and arts events he says should pay their own way. Rich Coleman said, it's not the government's job to decide whether a festival is commercially viable by subsidizing it. And you, you go, what? At the most extraordinary statement, considering that the Campbell government had only weeks earlier discharged its duties under the Olympic Charter to host one of the most heavily subsidized arts events on the planet, an Olympic Games and accompanying cultural Olympiad both of which were at the center of um, the 2001 New Era vision. I also thought of that, that when you think back to that playhouse, the funding tipped down. We uh, invested 67 million in concrete, curtains, and carpets so that the building would look fantastic when, when the world came to see, and it did. The trouble was that we couldn't afford to put a theater company 
into that building once we'd spent the 67 million on it. I'm going to finish. Oh, I'm going to finish with something that popped up in the in editorial in Globe and Mail about four weeks ago. It used to be that cities around the world practically tripped over themselves for the opportunity to host the Olympic Games. How times have changed. The Olymp International Olympic Committee is poised to debate who should host the 2022 Winter Olympics. Problem is, all of the candidates have dropped out except for two, Almaty, Kazakhstan, and Beijing, China. It's easy to understand why. The Olympics have become an excuse for massive overspending. Costs for the host can run into the billions of dollars. Costs like that are too high to be offset by any possible benefits, which is why the Olympics is becoming a tougher and tougher sell to taxpayers. Krakow withdrew its bid after a referendum found people of Poland saw it as an unnecessary burden. And even for a city or country with financial wherewithal, any benefits may be negligible or worse. New York City is a case in point. It does exactly need to raise its profile. Increasing tourism? Please. Officials worry an Olympic bid could distract from economic development based on sound public policy. And I think that's an... I'm going to read that last line again as I stop. Um, officials worry an Olympic bid could distract from economic development based on sound public policy. What's the point of having great concrete carpets and curtains if we haven't got the artists, as Herbert said in 1982, filling those spaces for the people who live here? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Duncan. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes uh, for discussion. Uh, if it's, that's right, Peter, yeah? Yeah, so uh, let me uh, offer some comments, uh, fairly brief comments, and then open it to the floor if that sounds good. Uh, I was intrigued by the, the title uh, for the session, uh, Invent Horizon, uh, which of course comes from the theory of uh, general relativity. Uh, it suggests a boundary in space-time uh, which doesn't affect uh, outside of observers. So we already have in the, to the fore issues of space and time uh, in the title. There's also the once in a lifetime uh, quote, which uh, I assume is the talking heads uh, uh, lyric. Um, je okay, so it had an Olympic. Uh, okay. As well as. And they took it. Okay. Rolling into text. Okay. Uh, when it comes to uh, mega events, and my own research is uh, focused mainly on the Men's FIFA World Cup, specifically uh, uh, the consumption and nationalistic enjoyment uh, and commercial drive in Vancouver, BC. With, meg with mega events, of course, the mega often uh, uh, refers to the spatial, uh, scalar uh, quantification and the size of the, of the entity. Uh, so in this session, we, uh, it brings to the fore uh, not simply uh, scalar or spatial uh, size, uh, but also the issue of temporality, uh, specifically the, the post-event uh, uh, politics, uh, cultural issues, and so on. Uh, recently, Usain Bolt, the Jamaican 100-meter sprinter, uh, was, was embattled with controversy surrounding his claim that the uh, 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow were a bit shit. And in, in this kind of uh, claim that he quoted, was quoted by a journalist, he questions the mega uh, aspect of the, the event of the Commonwealth Games. So uh, mega is a crucial aspect here in terms of the scale, uh, size, uh, branding, and so on. So let me uh, move to the, the papers. And one of the, the things that uh, the papers brought to the fore was the entanglements between uh, time and space. So the mega doesn't simply uh, refer to space, but also its uh, longitudinal uh, temporal aspects. Uh, Michael's first paper uh, brought to the fore issues of uh, juxtaposition, montage, and spectacle uh, with the 2012 uh, London Olympics uh, rep representation of the National Health Service, 
We see juxtapositions in terms of the, the credit crunch taking place around 2008 with the post-Olympic, uh, with the uh, post-credit crunch austerity measures which infused the organization and, and some of the politics of the London Olympics. We also have the uh, issue of temporality with the figure of the child as being a prime example of how to create a legacy uh, with the London Olympics. Of course, as Michael demonstrates, uh, much of the tensions with the mega event involves the political economy. Uh, the London Olympics required, relied upon billions of uh, pounds, uh, and this was double the estimate. Uh, for Michael, the key question in his paper is... Uh, a contradiction or a split between the infrastructure in terms of the theatre, this would be the bricks and mortar aspects of the, of the game, specifically the opening uh, ceremony, uh, juxtaposed with the show and performance as the, as the games themselves. Uh, Michael brings to the four issues of uh, the logic of financialization. Specifically, uh, what was intriguing for me was the, the drama that, ref that pertains to different uh, economic systems. Uh, in geography, Linda McDowell has written about performances uh, regarding the city of London bankers in terms of masculinity and femininity. So one, one question I had for Michael was that, uh, does uh, credit crunch uh, austerity measures uh, bring their own sort of specific dramas? That is to say, are there specific scripts, tropes, uh, scenes that uh, flow through the critical in infrastructure uh, when it comes to austerity. Uh, Michael also brought to the fore uh, a question he posed for himself, and that was this, uh, this contradiction uh, between uh, the performance and the amb ambivalence in terms of austerity and the Keynesian uh, state-led uh, funding, which was, uh, of course, in... Uh, contradiction with the Tory Lib Dem uh, ideology. So my question there would be, uh, could you offer some thoughts upon this question about the various contradictions? David's paper, still keeping in London, specifically the East End, uh, took us uh, on London 2013 uh, art pieces drifting through the ruins. Uh, here I was reminded of Walter Benjamin's work uh, on progress and capitalism, and, and one of uh, Benjamin's uh, fa favorite images was the, his... Uh, uh, copy, uh, original of Paul Clay's Angelus Novus. Uh, for Benjamin, this image of the angel looking backwards being buffeted by invisible winds with a storm of progress of capitalism. Uh, Benjamin also is at work or e echoes in uh, David's paper uh, with his excellent engagement with issues of uh, haunting, ghosts, wreckage, the wreckage of of mega events. We also have the uh, theme of the apocalypse and post-apocalyptic uh, landscapes, specifically uh, around the uh, East London uh, areas. Uh, David also brought a contradiction, uh, similar to Michael's paper, this time between the decay of the landscapes, uh, the kind of bumpy, bedraggled uh, flyers, which were an important uh, art piece, juxtaposed with the glossiness of digital uh, uh, ontologies, uh, labor, and so on. A key point in uh, David's paper was arresting the, th the flow through which things go on. The uh, London Olympics um, was, a was a mega event that was multi-layered. It was palimpsests of people's activities and the cultural landscape. Uh, here I was rem reminded uh, of the entanglements of the aesthetics and politics with uh, Jacques uh, Rancière's uh, Rancière's work, uh, where he seeks to consider the aesthetic as not simply secondary to the political, but the very terrain uh, through which uh, who, uh, decisions over who is allowed to speak, what is allowed to be shown, are brought to the fore. So I felt Rancière's uh, notion of, of the distribution of the sensible uh, may offer a way of thinking through the aesthetics and the politics. Uh, in Meg's paper, uh, this time moving away from London, but uh, uh, here in the, in the city of Vancouver, Meg brings to the fore uh, the importance of, of branding, specifically in the run-up to the, to the uh, Winter Olympics, but also into the after the post-Olympic event in keeping with the session title. For Meg, uh, a, a crucial question here uh, is how is a, a, a city of Vancouver uh, and other uh, agencies going to transform the urban uh, uh, space. Uh, Meg draws upon Bloch's notion of green cosmopolitanism, 
and she brings uh, to the fore issues of acceleration. That is to say, a demographic shift of people moving into uh, cultural spaces and whereby uh, life in the city uh, is almost a universal uh, aspiration for millions of people around the world. Uh, key to Meg's paper is the uneven development of a uh, mega event such as the Olympics in Vancouver. So Meg showed us the uneven geographies of housing growth in different uh, neighborhoods, districts in, in Vancouver. And in addition, Meg shows us the unevenness of acceleration uh, in terms of different parts of uh, speed, growth, development uh, in uh, the city of Vancouver. Uh, Meg brought an important point, which was that although it seems that it's a universal model for cities to be greening their infrastructure, greening their ideologies as well, uh, there are different politics at work within different cities around the world involving uh, greening issues. So my question for Meg then would be, uh, if there are different politics around uh, the world in terms of this model for greening, uh, how, how would uh, the different politics uh, take place with Olympic cities? Is the commonality of uh, politics of greening struggles with those cities that have hosted uh, Olympic events? Uh, Meg talks about how ha mega events embolden city leaders. There's dangers of overreach regarding uh, uh, mingling with uh, people's citizens' lives. Uh, Meg concluded about the uh, increase in modernization is one of the key uh, legacies of the event. Duncan's paper brought to the fore uh, tensions which were running through throughout the paper between the artistic event and capital, specifically economic uh, investment. Uh, Duncan brought uh, to the fore the, the shifts between uh, the creative economy and classes and its tension with the cultural uh, industries. Uh, there was also a shift in rhetoric over time uh, whereby art was increasingly a stand-in or avatar for economics. And I loved uh, uh, Duncan's vignette about performances in a small kitchen uh, in East Vancouver. And this recalled uh, Michael's uh, mention about the split between the show and the infrastructure, the stage here in Duncan's example, the kitchen, and the show, uh, which would have been a small-scale uh, production. Uh, one of my questions then for uh, Duncan uh, were about the, uh, the, the, the kind of aftermath of the event, of the mega event in Vancouver. And that is, uh, to what extent were the complaints, criticisms, critiques... Uh, resistances by various uh, arts groups and leaders to the provincial uh, government, to the city. That is to say, what kinds of uh, political mobilizations were at work after the event, and to what extent uh, were they successful or not? Uh, so I kind of attempted to summarize some of the key points and, and thrown in some questions for the individual presenters, but I also know there's no doubt questions in the audience. Sorry. Yeah, my, my attempts to actually get around the, 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 um, the, that area around Hackneywick and Stratford on a bike and how impossible that was because they blocked off everything. And um, you were sort of confronted with, you know, sec with, with security fences, um, paths that had been cut off um, um, or it had been uh, sort of blocked off by these massive building sites. And, and that's, this is what makes psychogeography an interesting method in terms of... Um, you know, sort of going through these spaces in a way that you're not even supposed to, you know, even because even as a cyclist, you really felt like you weren't supposed to be there. Um, as well, um, I, a friend of mine had her parents escorted out of the Westfield Shopping Center by security guards. Um, and they're quite, quite ordinary looking pensioners, but that just sort of gives, gives a sense of how, of how um, uh, sort of securitized you know, uh, space was. But, um, so that's, that's just a comment about, you know, my experience of, of you know, London 2013. I think that was about time I was riding around there. And the question for Duncan, I mean, I, I thought it was really interesting what you said at the end about how, um, you know, how, how all these cities have withdrawn their bids with the exception of, of Beijing. And, and what was the other city again? It was in Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan, Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think, I, I think what's, well, you know, the question that raises for me is really like, what's at stake? Why do these cities still want it when the others don't? And, um, and one of the things I feel like I keep hearing so far is this idea of the global. And 
I wonder if there was a kind of like um, insecurity on the part of certain maybe city planners that we want to be a global city. You know, we want the prestige of a status of, a status of the global city, or do we want that? Um, what do you think is at stake for these cities? Why do they want the games when, when others now feel it's, it's a bad idea? Um, on, the, on the question of um, you know why do people want why do, why is that switch I think I think the uh, the, the Sochi experience um, has has brought it home as what fifty billion um, I gave up looking for references to the cultural Olympiad in Sochi in the in the search engines because I couldn't find any reference to art um, so so I think it, I heard I, I heard someone speak when London. Paris and New York um, were bidding. I heard a, a, an urban star, Thornley, I think it was Andrew Thornley, talk that, that, that cities are now moving into to bidding for, for these mega events in the hope that they don't get them. Um, and the, the example they used was New York. There is one area of downtown Manhattan that has still to be developed. And when you get a mega event, because of the time factor, you can just bulldoze through. We've got to have an Olympic village. We will do it. It's going to look like this. And so when the plans for New York were being drawn up, um, this was going to be the Olympic village. So when New York didn't get it, it had all been done and dusted. Um, the, the, it's now being developed as uh, high-rise condos in, in the last remaining part. So there is this sort of area of, of, of doing other things. I always remember Anthony Pearl, uh, who was the director of urban studies at the time. It's wonderful how someone, he, his thing was um, the, carbon, the carbon highway, the super highway. And, and he told the story of, we spent more on carbon buses from... Whistler to Vancouver, he said what no one told us about was the fact that um, we have to ship the carbon by road um, from Quebec. Um, the, other, the other great example, which for me it, it says, says up this thing, is we had an Olympic village and we had a train track to, to Granville Island. Fantastic. So we spent 10 million bucks on laying new tracks we couldn't afford the trams, so we went out and borrowed them, I think, from Belgium. So we spent 10 million bucks on, on tracks, and we run these, these trams up and down them for six weeks or whatever it was, and then we send the trams back. And you just think, hold on a minute. <laughs> this is insanity. Because as the artists were saying this morning, 10 million bucks. The people are being given grants of 25,000. What do we need as a city? Do we need empty tracks going nowhere, or do we need um, Adrian to not go to Ottawa and stay and practice her craft in this city? I, I don't know. That's, that's probably not answering your question, but I'm just getting on. Get, hold on, I'll get off my soapbox there. <laughs> Hope that helps. Um, thanks to everyone. It, it feels almost as though the Olympics is kind of at some event horizon in terms of its sustainability and as the contradictions start to collapse in on themselves. Um, I mean, since 1960 in the Rome Games, that was the first Olympic Games in which urban regeneration was specifically foregrounded as a driver for the Olympics. So it feels as though we've kind of reached an end point of that. And of course, 1960 in Rome and its relationship to the situationists is also quite interesting. But, you know, in Michael's paper and also in Meg's paper, the, the contradictions are so apparent. I watched the Olympics opening ceremony live in Bristol and during the NHS um, sequence. People were weeping. The, the, the effective power of that scene was incredible. But, of course, that was happening at precisely the moment that the NHS actually, in effect, ceased to exist. It's not even been restructured. It's been destroyed, although its name continues under this rubric of NHS England, but it doesn't actually exist. In the same way that with Vancouver being the sustaining, you know, most greenest city by 2020 or whatever, the amount, the tonnage of concrete and carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, Chris Shaw has written about really well 
it's just, you know, those, those contradictions no longer become sustainable. So then the interesting thing is what then happens afterwards. And if you don't need the Olympics to actually uh, drive that urban regeneration, what then, what's the IOC going to do next? Because there doesn't seem to be much of a future for it. Can I just jump in on something you said um, about you watched the, the NHS and you people were weeping? Yeah. Were they weeping at the Olympic opening ceremony or were they linking, weeping at the artistic experience? I, I don't know. Something touched them. Um, and that is the power of art. Um, and so it, it, it's investment in the creation of, of, of art that I would, I would hazard a guess would, would lead to weeping on, on, on many levels if it's invested in. The cultural economist Anne Marcusen has just done a... Um, a, a year in Glasgow in the lead up to the Commonwealth Games and she, she led a whole series of discussions about the role of culture and culture they went through from the shipyards, the decline, urban regeneration through um, the European, it was the first European city of culture to get awarded it which actually had no culture as it were in the sense of there had been Paris, um, all the European, Venice, etc. This was the one which was centred on urban regeneration. And Anne Marcus makes the, the brilliant point that if you are basing your artistic activity upon how you're looking to outside, then in a way you've got a flaw in the mix because it, tourists are only going to go to Glasgow, this is her point, for sort of three, four months of the year. So if, you're, if your arts is based upon not the, lo not the locals, but the visitors, then it's a flawed design. Whereas if you look at Edinburgh, Avion, Adelaide, these are places that have built their artistic, their, their artistic program. The Edinburgh Festival started as a, as, a, as a, let's try and feel good after World War II, 1948, 49. And then 20 years later, tourists came. Um, so the tourism followed the art. Um, but we're seeing some examples now in festivals, Galway, um, outside Dublin, uh, Galway Festival, which was created for the people, for the, for the people, by the people, and was well attended and loved. But as the powers that be said, what we need is tourism, because tourism is money, et cetera, et cetera. So they've readjusted their program, and now the people um, are leaving the Galway Festival and moving on. So it's a very tender balance. It's a, a ecological art, I think. We have to break for some lunch soon, but I would just like to invite our other three panelists to maybe respond to, what, to Angela's question. If Tara has a mic behind you, if anybody wants to respond, or to any of the comments. To any of the sentences. It seems to me a legitimate, a legitimate question, and, but it's... It, it's one I, I, one I don't know the answer to. <laughs> it's really, it's really the honest question. In other words, yeah, once, once one particular trope gets exhausted, what, what, what takes its place? And, and, and we wait and see. But I think you're right to point that it is probably exhausted. Okay, we're hungry. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.